On a lonely planet, slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinoids. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race, one stranded explorer at a time. What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. Um, the first one in uh, Fortnite, I didn't get a chance to do one last week. Um, you know, I was busy. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the inspiration for this video, as you may have been able to tell from the intro, was a tweet by the official Kerbal Space Program Twitter and Instagram about, I don't know what the specific occasion was, but they, uh, they posted that photo of um, two Kerbals with the text Kerbal Rescue Program. And of course, many of you are aware that I do my own rescue series called The Blunderbird, so I thought it might be good to do a Blunderbird episode. This was actually brought to my attention by AstroGuy034 on Instagram, so thanks for the mention, mate. <laughs> uh, anyway, this I only saw the tweet uh, kind of yesterday, so I was trying to think of it's going to be hard to find a good rescue scenario on Reddit or Discord in that amount of time and get something made, whilst also having a somewhat challenging premise for a video. But then I remembered that Jebediah is stranded in a cave. For those of you that have seen Green Harvest and Expedition Eve, two of my Kerbal Space Program feature films, uh, some of the scenes in those movies feature Jebediah in a cave underground on Eve in a rover. However, the more astute among you will be well aware that there is no such structure on Eve, and I'm far too lazy to seek out mods, even though one of the central parts of Green Harvest was a modded star system. Apart from that, um, I couldn't. I didn't want to go out and find a mod that would add caves and stuff like Curb Town. So instead, I just used the existing cave in Kerbal Space Program which is the cave easter egg on Tylo. However, I still have the save file I used to create all those interior shots, and I never actually got Jebediah back. So I guess now the intro is all done and dusted, I can talk briefly about the rocket. You can see I've gone for this Apollo-style setup. Uh, we have three main components, really. We have the engine stage here, which is just a monolithic stage so that we're not leaving any debris in deep space, it's all just one giant stage that. We have the re-entry module, which is like the, you know, Mark II? Is it Mark II or Mark III? It's Mark II, right? <laughs> I'm having a complete mind blank. It's, uh, it's been two weeks since I played this game, guys. Give me, give me a break here. Uh, and then we have, uh, I guess it's actually four main components now I say it, because there's a little part in between. You may have noticed it. You can't see it on screen, but it's a hitchhiker's um, storage compartment, like a crew pod and an observatory module, and that's it which doesn't actually serve any purpose whatsoever for the mission, but it means that our Kerbals are not stuck inside that one tiny little Apollo-style module for the entire duration of the mission, because obviously we're going to Tylo, which is pretty far out, so we want some room to breathe. So it's got a gym in there, the pool is there, there's a cinema, um, you know, there's a gym. So, you know, they've got all the bells and whistles that they need inside that extra pod there, so just to make the mission a little bit more realistic, I guess. And then the final stage is the lander, which uh, had its own problems that you'll will quickly become apparent throughout this mission. I mean, this mission, I th I'm kind of happy with how it came out because it came out badly. In the it sounds weird, but we will um, we can cross that bridge as we get there. The first thing that didn't come out too well. You may notice that this rocket is incredibly overbuilt for what it really needs to do. As you can see, we are blasting our way off the launch pad at incredible speed. That's because. Generally, when I'm building rockets in Kerbal Space Program, I will create the payload, take a rough guess as to what I would need to get the payload into orbit. So when I say payload, I mean any any cargo, crew modules, that sort of thing, and any liquid fuel and oxidizing engines to get the payload itself uh, beyond low curve in orbit. Like when I say payload, it's all the parts of the rocket that aren't the bits needed to get it into its initial curve in orbit. Um, so I kind of look at the payload, gauge its size and weight, and think, ah, oh, we'll probably need this much rocket to get it into orbit, and then build the rocket, and that's what I do. I will then generally overbuild the rocket initially, and then I'll gradually just trim the fat to get the exact delta V usage, roughly where I feel like I'm not dumping too much fuel. Ideally, I'll be using all the fuel in the ascending stages. But, as you can see, our rocket here exploded 
<laughs> as we went up. So rather than I thought trimming the fat of this particular rocket like I would normally do, I thought, oh, it exploded, but the bits we need to survive have obviously survived. So let's see if we could just continue on. And it was like I intended this rocket to explode halfway up with most of it <laughs> still there. So I don't know, kind of funny. I, in reality, I would have definitely made that rocket a bit smaller. It was a bit overkill for what it really needed to be. But I thought it was, I thought it was kind of funny that the, it exploded and it still survived. And we still had way too much fuel, really, than we needed to get into orbit. So, my bad. Anyway, there go the fairings. There goes the launch escape system. I probably should have used the launch escape system, actually, when the main stack exploded. But, eh, they were fine, you know. Bill and Valentina there, they love life. Obviously, Bob had to stay at home. This is not really a mission where a scientist is needed. I felt that having a uh, pilot, obviously, would be a priority. And also an engineer would be more important than a scientist. Sorry, Bob. Maybe for the next mission. Maybe I should have had a command pod with four seats. Oh, well. Another mistake, eh? So, anyway. We have a nice and high apoapsis, and we have a long time to reach our apoapsis, which is just as well, because our next engine stage is actually kind of stuck in the middle of the rocket. We need to do some Apollo-style reconfigurations. The first thing we're going to do is separate the two modules, get Valentina into this pod, after I remembered that I didn't actually add a remote guidance unit to that section. The next thing I can do is deploy that kind of... get rid of that protective shield in between the two pieces. That's why I wanted to do this on a ballistic kind of suborbital trajectory, so all that debris that held the two modules together. And of course the lower engine stage would crash back into Kerbin's surface or its oceans uh, and not be left in orbit. I want to keep this mission kind of as de de debris free, debris free. And there they are, docked. It's a pretty easy dock. There's not much monopropellant in this thing because we don't really need much monopropellant. The hardest dock we'll be needing to do is actually docking the lander back to the mothership once it gets back from the surface of Tylo. And honestly, you don't really need uh, monopropellant for those sorts of dockings. At least, I guess, once you've had enough practice. I mean, if you're not very good at docking, I would definitely recommend using monopropellant. But once you've reached a certain point where you've done quite a few, you don't really need monopropellant. Anyway, we're going to be doing a quick circularization burn. As you can see, this craft has a very, very, very l uh, high, large, <laughs> great amount of fuel, but it only has four nuclear engines, which means that it's going to be very, very efficient. It can go a long way on the fuel it has, but it can't go anywhere quickly. You know, the nuclear engines have a very, very poor thrust to weight ratio. So we're going to be splitting our escape burn from Kerbin over two burns. So the first burn will get our apoapsis nice and high, just beyond Minmus's orbit, but still within Kerbin's sphere of influence. And then our second burn will get us the rest of the way to Tylo, or at least to Jewel. And then we can fine tune our Tylo encounter once we're in deep space, where it's going to be a little bit easier with the Maneuver Node Maker, and also a little bit cheaper because we're kind of not within Kerbin's gravity well. So now that we've got a better view of the rocket whilst it's on screen at the moment, I can talk about a few other things. I've obviously, obviously, I've already gone over the use of the nuclear engines and the liquid fuel, but also kind of a, there's a few other things to touch upon. Most of the things on the rocket, at least on the main core of the rocket, not the Tylo engine, are kind of there for aesthetic purposes. So it doesn't really need any of those solar panels because it's got an RTG, but I like the way the solar panels make it look all spaceshipy. It doesn't really need the radiators on the nuclear engine stage. Admittedly, nuclear engines use a lot of, like, create a lot of heat, so you will often get temperature gauges appearing when you're using the nuclear engines, but you don't really, I, I've never really found I needed to use radiators, except for when they first started adding the heating features to the game and nuclear engines were far more uh, explodey. These days, I don't really ever see a need for radiators, but it makes the ship look a little bit more visually interesting. I guess also the nose cones on the Tylo lander are also completely not necessary. They're there to make it look a little bit better because obviously Tylo does not have an atmosphere, so you really don't need to worry about aerodynamics. As you can probably tell, the rest of the lander itself is not the most aerodynamic structure because you don't really need to worry about it. I feel like it's weird to talk about Tylo this soon after my last Tylo video, which was that... Was my last video the Tylo video, or did I do a life on Lathe since... I think I've done a life on Lathe since the Saturn V to Tylo, but it really hasn't been too long since I went to Tylo. And I feel like I've been doing the dual system in general quite a bit <laughs> recently. Obviously, I've been doing the life on Lathe series, um, but I didn't actually intend to do a Tylo video this week. I was thinking about doing a Mun video or an asteroid video, given that Japan has just created a crater 
on an asteroid, but I was away, and technically still am. I'm not really back at... I'm not really, really able to have the resources. I'm not at home very much at the moment, so I have got time to... I didn't, I didn't get a chance to make a space news when it happened, and I generally like to get space news out within sort of 12 hours of any event. So, oops. Um, so I didn't do a space news on that. I mean, I'm, admittedly, I've only done two space news videos so far, so... I hope you guys like them. Uh, I am definitely taking on feedback and criticisms. Uh, I really do appreciate the criticisms because I'm not. It's not. A, it's not a format I'm really used to yet. Maybe probably ever, but at, yet at least as well. I'm not too familiar with making things of that format, so I'm very very welcoming of all criticisms uh, and critiques, even though those two things are synonyms. So I hope you're enjoying those. But no, I didn't. I didn't talk about the Japanese uh, making a crater on a uh, asteroid. But I thought I could do an asteroid capture mission this week and then kind of make send a probe there to kind of do a soft recreation of Japan making a crater in an asteroid, even though it wouldn't be much of a recreation at all. Basically, do something with an asteroid to celebrate Japan's <laughs> that was a weird way of saying Japan Japan's achievement. Okay. Uh, the other thing I had an idea for was possibly maybe eventually getting around to finishing the Minma Space Hotel and Casino series. Um, other videos I've had ideas for? I don't know. I, should... I actually have had a lot of requests to redo Blunderbirds, and I've get tagged in quite a few Reddit posts. Uh, specifically, I've had about three or four now, just Reddit posts, like self-posts. Oh, time warp glitched out a little bit there. Uh, it's because I'm using better time warp and I set it to fast physics and I keep forgetting that I've done that and so I'll set it to maximum physics time warp which when you're burning engines can have disastrous consequences. But no, I've had like, I've, I've been tagged in like three or four now Reddit posts asking for Blunderbirds to return and you know there are two reasons why I haven't done that many Blunderbirds recently. Well three. Because the first is that I've done everywhere. Like, I haven't done Gilly, Bop, or uh, Pol, but those places are pretty hard to strand Kerbals on. Uh, the second reason is that a lot of stranding, in air quotes, posts on Reddit are there basically to just bait blunderbirds. Or like, if you put blunderbirds in the title of your post, I'm probably not going to... Well, now I've told people what to avoid, but, you know, I just feel like a lot of people just do it because they want to be in a video, which is very flattering, don't get me wrong. I, I, I appreciate it immensely, and I still have to uh, pinch myself every time I see my views and subscriber counts. I'm still very grateful that people actually enjoy this drivel that I <laughs> send to your screens. But I, I don't know, I, I kind of liked it when Blunderbirds was a little bit of a smaller series, and so most of the, well, all the strandings were a bit more kind of natural, I suppose. Not to say the people that put Blunderbirds or Matt Lown in their Reddit post title are, you know, just placing Kerbals in places, but it, you do get end up seeing certain patterns. Because obviously I, I get tagged in pretty much every stranding post on Reddit, which is fine. And in fact, I, I, I still encourage people to do it if they would like to. It's not something I dislike, <laughs> but... You know, you end up seeing patterns of the certain kind of things you see, or like the same OP will post the same post over and over again. You're just like, uh, you're probably just trying to go to Blunderbirds episode. I've been, I've been stuck on this point for a bit too long, I think, because it's, it's one of the more minor ones. The other one is that the most people getting stranded are going to the Mun or Duna. Those are the two places people tend to get stranded on first, and I've already done the Mun and Duna quite a bit, so I feel like I don't want Blunderbirds just become blood, uh, like Mun and Duna rescues, which I think is what it would be if I just rescued every Reddit stranding I see. So kind of, I don't want Blunderbirds to become stale, so I will still do Blunderbirds, but it'll probably be like this, where it's a little bit more infrequent, and it might be sort of special missions like missions I might have accidentally left Kerbal stranded at, or people like Everyday Astronaut, Mark Thrum and Marcus House, we did one as well. Things like that, or if I see uh, a worthy Reddit stranding or Discord stranding or something like that, then, you know, I I'll do it then, but I probably won't do Blunderbirds as frequently as I did kind of a couple of years ago. Anyway, here we are on the lander. I want to talk about this before I've actually dropped all the stages, which admittedly is a bit uh, late because we've just dropped the last two stages now. But you can see this thing is kind of geared up to be an asparagus setup, but I was dropping the tanks two at a time, was in two per side at a time. Basically, these tanks were meant to drop off in se sequence, like a normal asparagus setup. But it wasn't draining properly. Like, the tanks were draining in pairs, but at different rates. It was really, really strange. I don't know if you could tell 
how the liquid fuel was draining. It, it seemed really weird. I was looking at fuel priority, and I tried rebalancing that. But fuel priority, when you change the priority of one tank, it changes the other. I don't really know how it works. But what's annoying is that the fuel lines themselves are intact. and did glitch out and disappear. And when I tested this craft before I actually did this mission, like I just designed the lander and then cheated it to Tylo Orbit just to make sure it could land and take off okay before I had to go to the trouble of actually getting it there for real. And it worked perfectly, so I think it's just one of those things that KSP just glitched out. And I look, you can see the visual glitching there, and I feel like one of the big demotivators for me for making videos, especially sort of complicated missions, is that Kerbal Space Program is still so buggy that, you know, you'll just run into these bugs that just slow you down and really grind your gears. Like, I spent about the best part of, like, half an hour to an hour landing that Tylo lander, trying to figure out what was happening with the fuel draining and how I could try and combat it to basically no avail. But I managed to figure out how to pair up the tanks. They would at least drain in some sort of order rather than, you know, just draining <laughs> haphazardly and sending the balances all off. But, like, it reminded me of... um. Struts and Blitz has been trying to do a Sigma initiative series where he colonizes every planet and he basically made a video saying that he was abandoning the Moho base because he kept on running into Kraken glitches and that sort of thing. And I empathize entirely. Like I have spent a long time on crafts and I've had to basically just abandon the entire video because the Kraken or just some dumb glitch basically prevented it all from working properly. You know, I get, <clears throat> you know, what we're doing is a lot of the time just breaking the game. We're using the parts how we're not supposed to use them. Like, um, you know, all, all credit to Stress and Blitz, it was a very impressive Moho base, but the parts, <laughs> the parts aren't really meant to be used the way he was using them. So I guess, you know, most <laughs> users of the game probably won't run into the sorts of glitches that these kind of ridiculous projects might run into. But still, it can get a bit disheartening when you keep running into these kind of glitches. Anyway, at least in this case, we managed to get everything done okay, and we can initiate the second part of the Tylo um, recovery, which is, of course, the getting back into orbit stage. Complicated somewhat by the fact I had to go a little bit of a higher jump up initially than I might have done because I had to clear the uh, roof of that cave. Other than that, fairly easy. You can see I'm using the aerospike engine again, even though the aerospike is actually an atmospheric engine, or at least designed to be best used in atmospheres, because an aerospike by design is good because it's efficient in an atmosphere. Well, it's efficient. It has the same efficiency pretty much, no matter what height you are in an atmosphere, whether in the thicker parts or the thinner parts, whereas most other engines, well, engines with a traditional bell shape, would be limited by the shape of the bell, whether or not they would be more efficient down low or up high. But the aerospike is you know, still a pretty efficient engine to use in a vacuum, and it has a very good uh, profile, like it's very, very small, and it has quite a high thrust value. So that's why I like using it for Tylo landers, even though it's, there are certainly probably better choices to use. Uh, they tend to be a bit more bulky or a bit more difficult to build into rocket designs. And, you know, the Aerospike is just, a, it's just, I just like using it. I guess I'm just used to it at this point because I use it in pretty much all of my Tylo landers. Uh, that's kind of why I use the Aerospike engine. So there is the mothership that we need to dock to. So the first thing we're going to do is set the docking port that we want to attach to as our target by double clicking it. The next thing we're going to do is try and roughly line myself up with it from a distance and then we can just coast towards it because obviously we're not using monopropellant here. So you want to try and do everything nice and far away so it's kind of lined up and then you can just cruise towards it at a nice and slow speed and the two ships should drift together. What I often do in these cases is switch to the mothership's uh, switch to the mothership and then, you know, target the lander using the mothership's docking port and then both ships will kind of automatically remain realigned, if that makes sense. You'll get it if you've seen my other videos, I suppose. But in this case, it wouldn't have really worked quite so well because we're docking to a side-mounted docking port. So I had to just rely on my mad piloting skills with a Z. Um, and as you can see, it, it paid off okay. And having, I guess, that docking port mounted to the side means that our ultimate configura configuration ends up looking a little bit like a space station of a Tylo, but we're not going to stay like this for very long. The first thing we're going to do is deorbit our uh, lander, so we're not leaving it stuck in floating around in orbit. We're going to make sure it gets destroyed by smashing it into Tylo's surface. I used the last of our onboard monopropellant there just to make sure that we would not kind of drift too far normal or anti-normal by having a displaced center of gravity, center of mass. It wouldn't really matter too much though. So we can just watch our lander drift away. 
And there it goes. And then we can just focus on getting back to Kerbin. As you can see, we have about 2,000 meters per second of fuel remaining. And we're not in an SSTO or anything that we would need to recover more than just the command pod. So I can rely on the very, very OP heat shields of Kerbal Space Program, meaning that we don't really have to worry about getting any kind of Kerbin encounter. As long as we get a Kerbin encounter, we can re-enter safely. So first thing I'm going to do is just burn uh, Prograde at Tylo, making sure that our Apoapsis ends up leaving Joule kind of backwards along its orbit so we get a nice and low periapsis around the sun so that it intersects Kerbin's orbit line. And then once we've left Tylo's Sphere of Infinite, it's going to create another maneuver node and kind of make sure we get a Kerbin encounter. Again, just a rough Kerbin encounter. We'll then do that burn and then do another maneuver node uh, to get our actual atmospheric encounter. I know that, you know, this is actually the first video I've done since the new update has come out where you've got a bit more control over the creation of maneuver nodes, but that still doesn't make the burns themselves uh, very accurate. I feel like that's probably more pilot <laughs> problems rather than the game itself. By the way, if you've not seen the new update for some reason, then here it is. We've got that nice HD skybox. So there's a few new parts. I think there's some new parts. There's some new nose cones that I hadn't seen before. I could well have just missed those and they were in a previous update, but I'd never seen them before. Uh, I guess, Kenny, you got... They basically integrated uh, Kerbal Engineer a bit more and uh, the mod Precise Node, which is a great mod that I've always kind of refused to use because I'm too lazy to learn how to use it. Uh, but I've always w thought it'd be really useful for doing very complicated missions like when you need to plan gravity assist. I believe this update will be uh, indispensable for people who wanting to achieve hyper-efficient flights. Anyway, this with the part where we finally fine-tune our Kerbin encounter. Again, we're going to do the last little bit of tweaking once we enter Kerbin Sphere of Influence because although we've only got 134 meters per second of Delta V remaining, we really don't need much. We're going to be uh, altering our apoapsis height, periapsis height, I should say, by a couple of meters here and there. So we're going to just point uh, anti-normal, uh, and then when we detach that decoupler, that's going to lower our periapsis even more slightly, and then we're going to detach our uh, kind of extension module because we don't need that anymore. We only need the command pod itself to survive because we've only got three Kerbals to worry about getting home safely. And there we are re-entering. Things are getting nice and toasty. Uh, moderate G-forces. <laughs> A good thing Kerbals are nice and resilient and don't really get killed by high G-forces. And then we can watch our capsule coast down. Now you know I said earlier that our Tylo lander didn't really work too well even though d despite during testing it was working, but well, I thought I might just showcase a little clip once we've landed of the Tylo lander actually working correctly so you can see how it was supposed to land. Uh, well, we've landed now, so we can cut to it. So here it is. I, I basically just started from 45, 45 kilometers, which is way, way higher than we would ever need to. It means that it it means that this can think and land even if I have problems during the flight like I miss my landing spot and need to do some adjustments on the descent that sort of thing I like to test it from a slightly higher altitude than I will need to actually land it from so yeah those were all the asparagus stages all dropped and you can see they worked perfectly and here we are touching down nice and safely without any problems whatsoever Okay, fine, there are a few problems on the touchdown. But, you know, we were pretty much there. It's because I messed up the burn slightly. And I yeah, I could see on Kerbal Engineer that I had enough Delta V to get back into orbit. So I called it a day with the testing there. Anyway, we should also call it a day on this video here. There are some links to more videos on screen as well as to subscribe to the channel. And there are links in the description for Discord, Twitter, Instagram, merch, that sort of thing. And there's a link to Patreon on screen as well. Thank you for watching.